Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> We'd like to welcome uh, the political. Can you hear or no? Sheikh Abdul Hamid, the speaker's outside in the side room. Uh, welcome Sami Hamdi, the political commentator, uh, who came all the way from DC just this morning. But it's Hadla Mashkura. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا مولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا من بين يديه الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصيهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أما بعد عباد الله قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ومن أحسن قولا من من دعى إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وقال تعالى في كتابه الكريم إنما العسر يسرى عباد الله الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran that there is no better speech than one who calls to the way of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and does good deeds and say I am from the Muslims but the ayah that follows afterwards tells you what the nature of this da'wah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is the best of speech. Allah says that the good deed and the bad deed are not equal. وَلَا تَسْتَوَى الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ The point being is that when you give da'wah, Allah is giving you context and saying to you that when you call to what is good and somebody responds to you with something that is bad, they are not equal in measure. Do not respond to them the way they responded to you. Continue in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that you give da'wah, regardless of the reaction and response or negative response that you receive. For Allah follows in the ayah where he says, Idfa' billati hiya ahsan. Conduct yourself in that which is best. And the word idfa' is also has the connotation of when you push, when you push back against that negative 
negative reaction. Push back with that which is better, with that which is best. For Allah says, for the one with whom you have an enmity with today, the one whom is your enemy today, the one with whom you are arguing with today, the one who is doing the backlash to you when you are calling out for the sake of Palestine and Gaza today, the one who is pushing back against what you are doing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that that person who today is shouting down at you, tomorrow might become your warmest ally. Allah doesn't say use the word Sadiq. Allah says Waliyun Hameem. Waliyun is the inter is the meaning of somebody almost like a protector, an ally. Waliyun Hameem, a warm ally. But Allah tells you who are the people who achieve this? Because many people read this ayah and they say, okay, da'wah is good, but there are some people where da'wah doesn't work on them. Allah has responded to those critics when he says that the only people who achieve this, where the other side finally sees the truth of the matter that you are speaking, Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا That the ones who achieve it are the ones who are patient. And note the meaning of patience here, the sabaru. Some Muslims, when they interpret patience, they assume that it means waiting. They assume that it means inaction. They assume that it means to sit and if it doesn't work the first time, be patient, something else will come eventually. Patience here means patience with the process, patience with the procedure, patience in your continuation of da'wah, perseverance in the da'wah, in that today you are calling for the rights and justice of Palestine and today you are calling for that which is the haq of Islam. Today they don't believe you, tomorrow they resist you, the third day they insult you, the fourth day they persecute you. Allah says those who are patient, they will see on the fifth and sixth day where they turn around and they say, I see the truth of this matter and I regret the way I treated you before. The same way we're seeing in the Western world today that people are finally waking up to the realities of the suffering of the Palestinians and those in Gaza. We are seeing those who supported the apartheid and Zionist project. We're seeing them today coming out and saying, I recognize the right to the Palestinians as humans. That's as a result of the da'wah and the perseverance. Those who are patient with the da'wah they found that those who yesterday were against the Palestinians, today they stand with the Palestinians. The reason why I give you that example, Ya Ibadallah, is to highlight that the state of the Muslim is one of constant da'wah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّا دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ Allah says, the call alone is not enough. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا They do the good deeds. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ They say, the reason I'm giving this speech and the reason I'm doing this action is because I am a Muslim who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling you that da'wah is about action. That da'wah is about mobilizing. That da'wah is about moving. That da'wah is about persevering in that movement. It's about persevering in giving that da'wah. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best example of this. There are many Muslims when they read the seerah, they brush over the first 13 years of the da'wah. We call it the period of the da'wah, the first 13 years. The reason being is that there are many who believe this period to have been a period of weakness. When in reality, when you look at it more clearly, you'll realize it was a period of spectacular strength. Because when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sahaba were in Mecca, they were persecuted by Quraysh. They were denounced by Quraysh. They were insulted by Quraysh. They were boycotted by Quraysh. Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu ta'ala an, when he defied Umayyah, they laid him on the ground in the sun and they put the rock on his chest. We saw the Muslims being beaten by the Kaaba, which is why Hamza anhu comes in and rescues him from that persecution. When you read the first 13 years, there's often a focus on the persecution, but not a focus on why the persecution was taking place in the first place. If the Muslims were not strong and didn't pose a threat, why was there a need to persecute them? Why did Quraysh, with their money, with their control over the narrative, with their weapons, with their armies, with their supremacy, 
in everything that we might today consider strength, why were they consistently annoyed and frustrated and then terrified of the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What made them worry about a people who had no tanks? What made them worried about a people who had no army? What made them worry about a people that had no money? What made them worry about a people that they could beat up and they could humiliate? next to the Kaaba when someone came and threw their organs of an animal on top of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Why is it despite their humiliation of the Muslims, they still felt the fear that meant they continued to persecute them? And I'll tell you why. It is because Quraysh, they found that the qawl of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the words of the Muslims who didn't have the army on their back, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam an army in those first 13 years. He did not give him the wealth and the riches in those first 13 years. Even when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was offered the wealth, he said, Wallahi, if you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not give up this deen. He could have bought Quraysh, but he chose not to. He chose to tolerate the persecution of the first 13 years. But what was Quraysh so concerned about? Quraysh were terrified that despite their supremacy in weaponry, their supremacy in money, their domination over the media and the narratives, their domination over the propaganda, Umar ibn al-Khattab leaves that power to join the persecuted Muslims. Musa ibn Umair would walk through Mecca and you could smell his perfume as he would walk by. Quraysh said, what makes Musa ibn Umair leave the life of luxury to join a group of people that we are superior to in every material way and who we are persecuting them what is it about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam whereby he has no power in the way that we de deem power to be but he is causing all of this shift in Mecca that is taking place Abu Talib on his deathbed says to Abu Sufi and the leaders of the Quraysh he says to them all he wants from you all the Prophet Muhammad sallam, wants from you is one word and Abu Sufyan responds and he says if all he wanted was a word we would have given him a hundred words the problem is the word he wants the problem is that word is more powerful than our army that word is more powerful than our money that word is making our elites leave our luxury to join him. They are abandoning the money to join the word. They are abandoning the army to join the word. They are abandoning the luxury to join these persecuted Muslims. When Ja'far ibn Abi Talib goes to Habasha, to Abyssinia, look how we interpret the first 13 years of the powerful life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was never ever abandoned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at any point during his life. The same way we are never abandoned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at any point in our lives. When Ja'far ibn Abi Talib goes to Habasha, when he goes to Abyssinia, the Quraysh, you would think that if the Muslims are weak, let them go, we don't need them in Quraysh. No! Quraysh send Amr ibn al-As, called the genius of the Arabs. They send him to Abyssinia, to Najashi, and Najashi says to Amr ibn al-As, I don't understand, why are you going through all this effort for runaway slaves? Because Quraysh felt that despite their armies and the control on the media and the money that they had, the word of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and those who stood with him spreading the da'wah, standing for justice, pushing back against the monopolies on the narrative, standing for Palestine and for Gaza, they realized that that message was causing such a seismic shift that these runaway slaves, as Najashi called them, were now affecting foreign policy of Quraysh. Even though they didn't have an army, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the control of the narratives. But the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Quraysh panic so much that they felt they had to persecute him. And they, what frustrated them even more is the more they tried to repress the Muslims, the more the elite of people of Quraysh would enter. Abu Sufyan when he goes to Heraclius, you've all read the story. He goes to Heraclius and Heraclius says, tell me about the Prophet Muhammad. 
He doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we will say it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The public opinion that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has brought about in Quraysh is so profound despite not having an army or money or control over the media is so profound that Abu Sufyan has two of his clansmen who are not Muslim and he finds himself unable to lie about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in front of his two clansmen. He finds himself unable to lie about the Prophet وسلم, in front of the Roman Emperor and he finds himself forced to say, we know him as Amin, we know him as trustworthy, we used to trust him with our wealth and our funds. And then Heraclius says, and this is about you, Ya Ibad Allah. Heraclius says to Abu Sufyan, and who are the people who follow this Prophet Muhammad? Is it the rich? Is it the elite? Is it the mighty people with huge influence? Who are the people who are giving him this power and strength that your tanks and your money and the media is unable to repress? Who are the people that who are giving him this victory that is making you panic, that in Quraysh you find no peace because even though you beat them every day and even though you persecute them every day, you cannot sleep at night because your sons are joining and your daughters are joining this deen of Islam. Who are the people delivering the success for the Prophet Muhammad wasallam? He said it is the ordinary people of our society. Ibadullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives us the sequence of events in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam, he did it for a reason, to give us examples about where we stand within this ecosystem that is Islam. There are many Muslims who say that I will mobilize when I have power, that I will do something for Palestine when I have power, that I don't have enough power to do anything and therefore it's useless. A Muslim will read Surah Hud and they will go to where Lut salam says, قَالَ لَوْ أَنَّ لِي بِكُمْ قُوَّةً أَوْ آوِي إِلَى رُكُنٍ شَدِيدٍ Lut salam, the Prophet, when his people come to oppress him, he makes a call out where he says, if only I had power or a powerful ally to resist you. Nuh salam, gives da'wah for 900 years and when you read Surah Nuh, it's a, it's a shorter surah, worth your time. Surah Hud, okay, you might think it's too long. Sammy, I might read a page, but I have other things to do. I've got American football to watch. Read Surah Nuh. And you hear Nuh salam, says something very similar to what you perhaps are saying inside yourselves. Rabbi inni da'awtu qawmi layla wa nahara, wa lam yazidhum du'a'i illa firara. وَأَنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعْلُوا أَصَابِعُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَخْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا Nuh makes a complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, I have called on my people day and night. And when I call on them, they run away from me. When I tell them Palestine, they run. When I tell them Gaza, they run. When I tell them hear my call, they run. Now we don't want to hear it. And when I call on them so you might forgive them. They put their fingers in their ears. I don't want to listen. I'm canceling you on the media platforms. I'm shadow banning your accounts. I'm shutting down your social media accounts. I'm not interested listening in what you have to say. Nuh salam had the same feelings that we have. Why does Allah put this ayah in the Quran? For Allah la yantiqu anil hawa. Allah does not say something in vain. Allah says it for a reason. It's to tell you, Ya Ibad Allah, there is nothing wrong with feeling these feelings. What's wrong is if it leads you to do nothing. Because Nuh alayhi salam, while he makes his complaint, is still giving the da'wah laylan wa nahara. Lut alayhi salam is complaining about the lack of power and ability, but he's still calling in his people to come to Islam and come to the deen. Why? Because these prophets understood something that we have to understand, which is that the outcome belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they were but vehicles to deliver the message. Ibad Allah, if I was to say to you that Nuh alayhi salam, Shu'ayb alayhi salam, Hud alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam, 
Lut alayhi salam. If I was to tell you that all of these prophets went to their people and only managed to convince a tiny group of their people to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would you dare to say these prophets failed? No. Why would you not say that? Aside from the fact that you think it's layer Jews, shara'an. There's another reason why when you really start thinking about it, it's because subconsciously you acknowledge that their aim was never to convince their people their aim was to convey the message and be the vehicle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for them. Because they knew that the outcome belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. When the prophets before they die, they are given a choice by the angels. They say, Allah has offered you two choices. Would you like to remain in this dunya until yawm al-qiyamah? In other words, see the fruits of your labor. Or do you want to return to Jannah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets? Every prophet chose Jannah. Why? Why didn't the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, linger to see Islam in Al-Quds or see Islam in New Jersey or New Jersey or see Islam in these other places? Why didn't Prophet وسلم, wait to see it? Because he didn't need to. Because he knew the outcome belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and he trusted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yudhi'u ajra man ahsana amala. Allah does not let the good deeds go in vain. Ibadullah, when you are giving da'wah today, the reason I mentioned the first 13 years of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to highlight that what Quraysh feared more than anything else is they realized that it doesn't matter the power they had, Islam was winning the hearts. It doesn't matter the money they had, they couldn't buy people away from Islam. When Suhail ibn Amr signed the treaty of Hudaybiyyah, he went back to Quraysh, one of the clauses of Hudaybiyyah was that those who leave Mecca to go to Medina have to be sent back to Mecca. But those from Medina, it wouldn't work the other way around. It was all one-sided. Suhail ibn Amr was very happy with this deal. He said those in Medina have to come back to Mecca, but those in Mecca, we don't have to send them to Medina. And when Abu Jandal came after the signing of the treaty, he said, Ya Rasulullah, take me with you. And Muhammad said, Sabran ya Abu Jandal. I've just signed the treaty, I can't take you back. And the Muslims were angry, they were livid. They thought it was a defeat. Umar al Khattab exclaimed, opposed the Prophet, not opposed, but said to Prophet, Salam, Alasan al Haqq, are we not on the truth, Ya Rasulullah? When Suhail ibn Umar went back to Abu Sufyan and Quraysh, he said, Look at this amazing treaty I've signed. We have an extradition, but they have to extradite to us, we, no, we don't have to extradite to them. And Abu Sufyan is reported as having said to him, Yes, Suhail ibn Umar, do you think this is a victory? The problem is when one of them enters Islam, they never leave. Who's going to come back from Medina to come to Mecca? You've misunderstood the power of Islam here. The problem is he keeps taking people away from us through his words, despite the fact that we have the army and the power. Ibadullah, don't underestimate public opinion. For Wallahi, when Abu Sufyan sent somebody to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to say, tell me what his Sahaba are like, and he came back, and he said, Wallahi, if you were to give them mountains of gold, they would never abandon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because there is something, a terrifying power about Islam that worries those who repress the Ummah and who repress the Muslims and who seek to impose restrictions on freedom. Ibadullah, don't think Islam is opposed to freedom. You know, Islam thrives in freedom, and I'll tell you why. Because Islam appeals to the mind and the heart. When you have an environment of freedom, you have an environment where Islam becomes the fastest growing religion. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, La ikraha fi deen, I want you to enter willingly. When you see people after what happened in Gaza entering Islam, they're not entering Islam because there are all this military might and military power or the like. Because clearly they're seeing Muslims being killed on TV. So what makes them enter Islam despite seeing that persecution? It's the resilience of an ummah that despite that persecution and the lack of what they deem to be power, they are demonstrating a power that money can't buy, a power that militaries can't deploy, which is the power that no matter what, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is the fastest growing proclamation 1400 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You believe that to be insignificant, they believe it to be terrifying. They cannot understand how they go abroad to kill Muslims, but find their own population becoming Muslim. 
They cannot understand how they came to be the leaders of the free world. But in this free world, they find that their values are declining while Islamic values are on the, are on the rise. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has looked after his deen. It is not Muslims that make Islam great. It's Islam that makes Muslims great. It's not you who makes Allah great. It's Allah who makes Muslims great. When you choose to be a vehicle for Allah, Allah elevates you. When you choose not to be, Allah humiliates you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not said go out and achieve the outcome. Allah has said go and strive and watch the barakah I will put in your striving. That's why Allah said, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Those who strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ They believe in Allah. They are striving because they believe Allah is in charge of the outcome. Allah doesn't say their result is rewarded. Allah says that it's their striving that is rewarded. Because, يَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ Musa ibn Umayr رضي الله تعالى عنه did not see Fatah Makkah. Does that mean he failed? Absolutely not. He convinced Medina to become the base of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hamza radiallahu anhu died in Uhud. He didn't see Fatah Mecca. Will you turn around and look down on him as less of an honor than those who entered Mecca? Absolutely not. Because Hamza radiallahu anhu had the greatest honor. He was the vehicle through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used and he became the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality is, the reason we honor the Sahaba, you will realize, the reason you honor the Sahaba and why you love them is because you love the fact they were chosen by Allah to be the vehicles, even though many Many of them did not see the outcome that they long to achieve. And that's why, Ya Ibad Allah, I want to leave you with this on this first part of the khutbah, which is, Ya Ibad Allah, Muslims have made the difference in public opinion when it comes to Gaza and Palestine. It's unprecedented. No matter what happens in Gaza and Palestine now, once that ceasefire comes, all of the journalists in the world will say that Netanyahu is the one who failed. The whole public opinion has shifted. We're seeing people who never cared about Palestine now talking about Palestine. And that's because of the dawah of the ordinary people. That's because you kept going and you kept persevering. And Allah says, وَمَا يُلَّقَهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا You were patient through the heartbreak. You were patient through the despair. You were patient through the pain. You were patient through the images. You were patient through the, 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 the absolutely heartbreaking images you were seeing. You were patient in that through those tears and heartbreak, you kept raising the voice for Palestine. And we're seeing that shift in public opinion on a social and political level itself. Allah has told you that he has managed to turn those who are against Israel, he's managed to turn them pro-Israel, uh, pro they're now pro-Palestinian. Those who were Zionists before are now today advocating for the sake of Palestine. Allah, the one who flips the hearts, has flipped the hearts. Because subhanahu, he is the one in charge of the outcome. And when Hadith Qudasi, you take one step, Allah takes ten. We took one step, Allah took ten. But ya ibad Allah, for those of you who believe and think will walk away from this khutbah and say that Sami came from London to tell us that we shouldn't care about an outcome. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying trust that Allah has the outcome in this dunya and strive for another outcome. The outcome that you read in one of the short surahs. Which is that after going through what Nuh salam went through, where you're giving the da'wah and you feel you're not getting traction, where you're striving and making efforts, but you feel perhaps you're not achieving what you want to achieve. But you keep going and you keep mobilizing where you feel you're making all this effort But the return is not as much as the effort that's being putting in even though you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And then you lie on your deathbed and you say is this all my life? I tried I tried I tried I tried and I didn't get the results that I wanted Allah tells you that for these people When they lie on their deathbed and their soul leaves their body They don't hear ya ayatuha nafs al khabitha Oh disgusting soul that didn't do anything, that didn't mobilize, didn't move, didn't give da'wah, didn't use the powers that I gave you. Instead, they will hear the most beautiful outcome, which is when their soul leaves and they haven't achieved the outcome they wanted in this dunya. We might not see liberation of Quds in our lifetime the same way the Prophet Muhammad did not see liberation of Quds in his lifetime. We might not. But that's an outcome that's decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But Allah has promised us an outcome regardless of whether Quds is liberated or not although we keep striving for it, which is when the soul leaves and we say, Ya Allah, but I wasn't able to liberate Al-Quds. The angels, they will say, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, sweet-smelling soul. Oh, lovely soul. The angels will say to each other, there is a, do you smell that? 
This is a soul that through the heartbreak they kept going, through the despair they kept going. They said, Rabbi inni da'utu qawmi layla wa nahara wa lay du'a ila firara. But they kept going. They saw the images, they never sat down, they kept going. Through their tears they kept going. They would wake up with their pillows drenched in their tears over their heartbreak. But they never said, I'm going to stay in my bed and do nothing. They kept going through because they believed Allah would eventually deliver the outcome and they wanted the honor of being the vehicle. Oh sweet, beautiful, smelling soul. Come back to your Lord. You know what they say to the soul? They say, come back. Allah is pleased with you. Allah is happy with you. Allah is celebrating you. Allah says, look at this wonderful, beautiful soul. And inshallah, one day, Allah may Allah liberate Quds in our lifetime. But if he has decreed that it won't be, may Allah give us the companionship of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Jannat al-Firdos where one day we will sit with him and with Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and with Umar al Khattab and when we enter the gathering Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi will just be finishing the story about he, how he liberated Al-Aqsa and we say Salaamu Alaikum to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he says Wa Alaikum as to us which generation are you and we will tell him Ya Rasulullah we are the generation that finally broke the Zionist monopoly over the, over the narrative and while we didn't see Quds liberated we did what we did what we did what we could and he will say sit down in my company and then another man will come and pass a man and his sister perhaps and they will say to us and we will say what generation are you they will say we are the generation that came straight after you and we liberated the quds and al-aqsa and barakallahu feekum for winning the battles that paved the ground for us to be able to finally liberate al-aqsa or the like how happy will you be in that moment when he looks and he says ya rasulullah because of their efforts we were finally able to liberate al-aqsa may allah make us amongst that companionship أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم لسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله عباد الله remember these words remember that Allah سبحانه وتعالى is in charge of the outcome and يا عباد الله is there any being better than Allah سبحانه وتعالى to be in charge is there anyone worthy of trusting other than Allah سبحانه وتعالى if Allah says that he has it sorted is there anybody better to trust than Allah سبحانه وتعالى in order with the affairs and the outcomes of this ummah so يا عباد الله may Allah make us the vehicles for the change he is going to bring about may he honor us to be the vehicles for the outcome that he has already decreed may Allah allow us to witness the outcome that he has already decreed may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the celebrated in Jannah may Allah give us the best of outcomes where we are the nafsul mutma'inna may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our status in this dunya and the akhirah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the patience and perseverance of da'wah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us signs for Islam for the rest of the community may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our deeds may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our mistakes may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a source of solace for those in Palestine as we stand and raise their voices we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give solace to those in Gaza we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give justice to those in Palestine we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us pillars of justice we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us pillars of truth we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the wisdom to engage with the others we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us success in all of our endeavors and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never burden us with more than we can bear and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us push through our broken hearts we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us push through the despair we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to push through those images we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give relief to those in Palestine and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell those in Palestine that the ummah stands with them the ummah is trying for them the ummah is doing what it can for them we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate our powers and capabilities for Palestine we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to amplify our voices we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to make the difference we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver his justice swiftly we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to liberate al-aqsa and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind this world that in the history of mankind whenever the Jews were persecuted by the anti-semites they found haven amongst the Muslims 
every single time, whether when they fled the Spanish Inquisition, whether when they fled the Holocaust, whether when they fled the Warsaw Ghetto, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the eloquence to remind this world that the people of justice over the past 1400 years were always the Muslims. The parables of coexistence were always the Muslims. The Jerusalem of Europe is Sarajevo when it was under the Muslims. The, the parable of coexistence Andalusia when it was under the Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us of our own history, to make us appreciate our own history and to make us accept that identity and embrace it wholeheartedly and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory for this ummah to unite it and elevate it and make it the example for this world that is in desperate need of a just global order Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawalana fi man tawalayt wa barik lana fi ma aatayt wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt Allahumma inna na nasaluka al-firdawsa wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal wa na'udhu bi من النار وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإصرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار وارض عنا يا ربنا وادخلنا الجنة يا ربنا برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العلي الجليل يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وأهم وأتم وأعظم وأكبر أقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Make your line straight. Don't leave gaps. Pray as if it is your final prayer. For Allah, only Allah knows when we will meet Him. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الذين يحملون العرش ومن حوله يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويؤمنون به ويستغفرون ويستغفرون للذين آمنوا ربنا وسعت كل شيء رحمة وعلما فاغفر للذين تابوا واتبعوا سبيلك وقهم عذاب الجحيم ربنا وأدخلهم جنات عدن التي وعدتهم ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم وقهم السيئات ومن تق السيئات يومئذ فقد رحمته وذلك هو الفوز العظيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده ربنا لك الحمد والشكر على كثير مبارك طيب الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله جزاك الله خير سامي حمدي for visiting with us today uh, inshallah tomorrow if you're going to the rally the buses are going to be leaving here at Fedj if you have not bought your tickets, I think there's a handful of spaces left, so make sure you stop by the office before you go to register for your seat. If you're not going to go to the rally,